What a showcase for Maisie Williams, huh? What a performance. The woman who lived, the woman who kicked butt, if you ask me. I'm going to have to unlock a whole new carton of praise for this episode. Maybe a whole truckload, maybe a trainload. Episode 6 of Series 9, The Woman Who Lived. I'll get to Maisie Williams in a bit, but first, there will be spoilers. You are so advised. Spoilers. And go. I want to start here with the script by Catherine Tregenna. It's her first for Doctor Who. She has four episodes of Torchwood to her credit and a long line of British police procedurals. This is the first time in the current series that Stephen Moffat has assigned a part two to a different writer than part one. The director is the same, Ed basal -Gett. It might just be a scheduling issue, but I can see why a different writer was called for. Certainly a woman's perspective is very helpful here, because this part two is not like the others. In fact, this episode is not like any Doctor Who episode I can remember. This is the first episode I can think of that revisits someone that the Doctor has saved and looks into what their life has become. In most episodes, there's comedy, adventure, thrills, scares, and a light sprinkling of regret. In this episode, the recipe is flipped. Here, the main ingredient is regret, flavored with sorrow, anger, and philosophy, with a light sprinkling of comedy, thrills, and adventure. The premise has been sitting right under our noses since last summer when we saw this snippet at the end of the trailer for the series. A girl unmasks. The doctor says, You? What took you so long, old man? Cheeky. They seem to know each other. There was lots of speculation last summer about why the doctor and Maisie Williams recognized each other. Was she the doctor's daughter? The master's daughter? His granddaughter, Susan, from the very first episode in 1963? Maybe the doctor was just a fan of Game of Thrones. Well, now we know. She's the girl who died all growed up. A shielder, the young Viking girl who gained immortality when the doctor suddenly remembered why he chose his face. Long story. A shielder is back. But she's almost an entirely different person in this episode. Viking times were 800 years earlier. How much would you change in 800 years? She has dropped her name, pretty much lost all memory of her childhood village, all her innocence, all her poetry. The only memory she has retained from that time is the doctor and Clara and her resentment at being abandoned by them. When he made her immortal, the doctor gave her a gift that came with a curse. He regretted it instantly, but then he ran off, ran off in his box, as he always does. Didn't even stick around to give her a brief orientation on what to expect living the life of an immortal. The passing of 800 years has left her a deeply sad, deeply cynical, world-weary person. She has outlived her village, her culture, her language, her friends, her lovers, her children, generations of her children. She calls herself Lady Me now, early harbinger of the Me generation. She has had more experience than her brain can retain, so she's filled volumes and volumes and volumes with her journals. She has grown rich. She has grown reckless. She has grown crafty. She has grown strong. Tregenna has imagined Lady Me's story with depth and written it brilliantly. The story gains a huge amount of focus by keeping the companion out of it until the very end. It becomes a character study of both the doctor and the girl he saved. The poet, formerly known as a shielder, has disappeared into a woman of substance, sophisticated, worldly, angry, and cold. She seems to have lost all compassion and empathy, and by night, She's a brazen highwayman called Nightmare. Gender pun, not the Night Stallion, but the Nightmare. In many respects, Lady Me is now the intellectual equal of the Doctor, fully capable of challenging him, collaborating with him, double-crossing him. And she is played by an 18-year-old girl whose first professional gig was Arya Stark in Game of Thrones. Maisie Williams was 12 years old when she was cast as Arya. We've watched her grow up. We've seen her on YouTube. She collabs. She has her own channel. And on Vine, she revealed her obsession with Audrey Hepburn. Your eyebrows look like Audrey Hepburn's. It's not an obsession. <laughs> Your eyebrows look like Audrey Hepburn's. I don't know if any of that prepares us for the range of her performance on The Woman Who Lived. <laughs> Your eyebrows look well, like Well, maybe Audrey the obsession Hepburn's. with Audrey Hepburn. These costume designs give you a hint of the range she's asked to reach. I imagine William's agent now has this episode on the desk of every casting director in London and Hollywood. Me's conversations with the Doctor are perhaps the deepest exploration the series has ever given us of the Doctor's dilemma. An immortal who dares not engage with anyone because he knows our lives are fleeting. He calls us mayflies. And at the same time, it's an exploration of the Doctor's aftermath on the people he saves. But the conflict between Lady Me and the Doctor is only one of this episode's concerns. There are two other subplots. Lady Me is also involved with a memorable alien, Leandro, played by Arion Bacare. Glowing eyes, fire-breathing, the best bipedal lion makeup since Bert Lahr in Wizard of Oz. But unlike the cowardly lion, Leandro's intentions are not what they seem. In addition, 
and he's involved with the rogue thief, Sam Swift, played by Rufus Hound. No. Rufus Hound, a popular British comedian and presenter, captured and condemned to hang Swift, stalls for time by launching into a routine of stand-up gallows humor. Murray Gold's score is one of his best and nimblest, and in some very deft plotting, screenwriter Tregiven brings all three of Lady Me's stories together at the climax. Her quarrel with the Doctor, her entanglement with Leandro, and her relationship with Sam Swift all fuse into a single focus and a rousing finale well staged by Ed Bazalgette. When we learned that the Hooniverse had welcomed a new human who cannot die, a lot of people immediately thought of Captain Jack Harkness, and I guess so did the showrunner. He assigned this story to someone who had written for Captain Jack. Together, even had the doctor mention the captain to the woman who lived, said they might meet someday. Hope they do. That final conversation in the episode brings both the doctor and Lady Me to a mutual understanding. The doctor said he would watch over her. She said she would watch over the people he abandons. It's a deeply satisfying ending to a rich, character-driven story. Until next time, I'm Mikola. <music> DVD Extras, let's start with your comments. 40 Second Life said they couldn't subscribe to my channel for fear of causing a tidal wave. Nice try, but I know you subscribed on March 9th, 2010. Thanks for sticking around. Several folks, including Breadcrumb, Dylan Shadowstar, not happy with the Doctor's choice to revive his children in the first place and make her immortal. I wonder how they feel now after seeing Part 2. Was the payoff worth it? Please let me know. Raggedy Adams said they should have called her the character Arya Starkness. Nice pun. Captain Arya Starkness, I think. Louis Pinto thinks they should have waited until later in the season to schedule this episode. I agree. It's an 800-year gap. I think there might be more impact if these two episodes hadn't run back-to-back. Michael Tannock didn't particularly like the episode, especially Odin in the Sky, a clear Monty Python tribute, or Echo, or Swipe. Masterby didn't like my flash effect. What do you think? Should I drop it? Robert Diaz noticed that the Doctor getting weak villagers ready for a raid by warriors is an homage to Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Wish I'd caught that on my own. I love Seven Samurai. Gary C. and Evening Blues 81 agree with me about Capaldi being a superb doctor. Evening Blues added the good news that Peter Capaldi has signed on for a third series as the doctor. A couple of tidbits. The part of Clayton, Lady Me's servant, was played by Struan Roger. It's his first appearance on Doctor Who. We haven't seen him before, but we have heard him. He was the voice of the face of Bo. The doctor at one point calls Leandro Lenny the Lion. That, I learn, is a reference to a British kiddie show from the 50s and 60s. Lenny was a ventriloquial figure, sometimes referred to as a dummy. Those are two of the ten things mentioned by Fraser McAlpine in his Anglophenia blog. Those are ten things. Link in the description. Give him a click and you'll learn the other eight. Those are eight things. As usual, a playlist of other people's reviews of this episode. And a place where you can catch up with my reviews of previous episodes. Oh, here's a bit of Rufus Hound stand-up. It's a bit rude. Be warned. Be warned. And some samples of Maisie Williams on YouTube. Bye now. <laughs>